record. Thank you for reminding me. Although nobody's absent, but it won't hurt to have it up online in the future. I don't see this going away anytime real soon. At least for the winter quarter, we'll probably still be online. And I don't know. I'll have to be more confident in their vaccine than I am right now. Uh, I'll let it, I'll wait and see who dies from it before I take it. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. I see something. <laughs> Is it the Epic of Gilgamesh? Yep. yep. Yeah. All right. So, um, I was going to talk about the history of writing for a second. Uh, where would that be? So the Epic of Gilgamesh is one of our oldest works of literature. Um, and it's written on not cave painting, um, baked in clay in cuneiform. Uh, so it's very easy technology to use. Uh, you get clay when it's, you know, not baked. Um, and then you put the shapes in there that you want it to be, and then you put it in an oven and bake it. And that makes it last through wet, wind and rain and stuff like that a lot longer. Um, do we have a stylus? Yes. Okay, so that's what we call a stylus. I think it is on wax. Oh, yeah, duh. <laughs> but uh, it works the same way on clay. Um, the Epic of Gilgamesh is on these tablets. And tablets have a, well, they have one big advantage over any other kind of information storage system, um, any other information storage system we've ever come up with. Uh, what happens to these clay tablets, let's say you've got one you reuse every day and you're in a little shop and then you erase it, maybe put a little water in if you need to, and then make your new list on the next day. And then the shop burns. So what happens to that clay tablet? Still gonna remain, it's, yeah, it's pretty it can, durable. It doesn't go away, it just gets hard. So we found a lot of stuff in ancient Mesopotamia uh, that wasn't meant to endure. Um, now, one of the drawbacks of clay, we see right over here, um, it's very hard, but it's also brittle. And so over time, this clay tablet breaks. Um, as you can see, a lot of this one's gone. Um, the other drawback is, um, let's imagine your biology textbook baked on clay. What would that look like trying to cross campus with one of these? You're gonna break your back. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you'll need a moving van to carry the thing, no matter how uh, much information you get on any one tablet, it's still going to be super heavy. Or get um, super strength. What's that? Or get super strength. That's right. S scholars will be much more bowed up in under this uh, system than they are right now. Um, the, it'll be you guys beating up the football players in the quadrangle and not the other way around. Uh, so yeah, um, it's a drawback. Now, do we use this technology today? Not, not. No, not Let's really. Let's say you're in the not student per se. What's that? Not per se, but the idea is there, just not the materials. Well, imagine you're in the student center and you get hungry for one of those sandwiches over in Tolliver. What's that going to be like getting from one place to another? 
to previous classes with the names on them. Yeah, right. You can, uh, if you know where to look, Bruce McGee is one of those. I've got a brick. So names on bricks, that's Sumerian Technology 101. Uh, they may have a little fancier stylus, but they've got something, some kind of style. And it'll be a stylus. It may be guided by, um, you know, or maybe they have letter shape stamps that they put into it. Either way, the, the basic technology is there um, and still in use. Also, when I was a kid, we used to do, I used to love to find um, concrete that was wet so we could scratch into it. And that stuff can last a pretty good while. Oh, here we go, tech bricks. So yeah. Someday, if you stick with it, folks, you'll have your own brick. <laughs> Now, um, a related technology is chiseling in stone. It's a lot harder and takes longer. So it's more, and it's stone rather than bricks. So it's much more expensive, but you still see it. Like if you go around the old, can y'all see that? Ruston State Bank dimly. Mm -hmm. um, so that was etched in there. And when you etch it in stone, what are you telling your customers? They got money. They got money and we're rock solid, right? We're going to be here. <laughs> Ruston State Bank is the bank that Bonnie and Clyde did not rob. Um, so back in the, when were they, the 30s? Um, they were all up in this country here. And one day, one of our town leaders was walking down the street he saw a lady standing by a car and she was smoking a cigar. And, you know, he said, that's unusual. Most ladies don't smoke cigars, but you know who does? Bonnie Parker. And so they rounded up the, <laughs> the local um, guys with guns and they stood all around the bank for a couple of days and it did not get robbed. So that's what that sign is saying, right? We're too tough for Bonnie and Clyde. Now, what is Paramount Healthcare Consultants telling us with its sign? We don't have as much money. <laughs> right. You better come in quick because we might shut down at any moment. We can't even keep our sign looking right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you don't have to do much attending to a stone sign. Uh, okay. We'll talk more next week about the um, history of writing part two. All right, so um, this is one of the oldest civilizations. This is 5,000 years ago. I think civilization in this part of the world goes back maybe 10,000 years. Um, I'm not sure who was there before Sumer, though, so I could be wrong. Anyway, very ancient civilization. Um, this was called the Fertile Crescent until they uh, polluted it with salt and stuff stopped growing and it's more or less a desert now. Um, welcome to Mother Earth. <clears throat> now, in the Bible, we learn of Abram or Abraham coming from the city of Ur. Uh, today, we're studying the city of Uruk, which is where the king lived. <coughs> um, they built ziggurats, uh, which are similar to uh, the pyramids of Egypt but they don't have the smooth sides. They have layers at, uh, notched into them. And also, I believe these were temples rather than um, burial mounds. They're a lot more, oh, sorry. I was just saying ahead. that uh, they're a lot more similar to uh, like Central American uh, temp 
temples to those kind of ziggurats. I've heard that, and I've heard people speculate, wondering if there was some kind of crossover, which, um, you know, like pre-Columbian uh, trips across the... But I think, you know, it's a pile of dirt. Um, there's one near us at um, Poverty Point, uh, the Poverty Point uh, Native Americans uh, built these huge earthen mounds, I think from the air or in the shape of a bird. So uh, uh, if you like ancient alien conspiracy theories, uh, go have at it. It's built for aliens, but you know, it could also be built for gods, right? If the gods are looking down on our great big bird. And also the delta over there is huge, you know, very flat. And I've always thought these uh, things you know, an area like Louisiana would serve a practical purpose because nothing like an artificial hill in the middle of a flood. Um, I'd say live near the Mississippi. Okay, moving on. Here's some uh, American soldiers desecrating a ziggurat. Um, let's see, map, ziggurat ruins. Okay, so... Um, there's a lot of typology. We find a lot of it in Genesis as well. Um, vertical typology is the idea that something on the earth, which this is, is built to match something in the heavens. Now, Genesis takes a look at these ziggurats uh, in these pyramids and says, uh, these are people trying to build a stairway to heaven and it's impious, you're trying to you know, contend with God. And so God split up the humans and made them all speak different languages, except Americans. We only speak one language. <laughs> um, said, except for the Americans, we won't bother with making them learn different languages. Uh, they'll just create confusion wherever they go. Ah, so here's Gilgamesh. Um, historians think he was real but he's like been reinterpreted to be bigger than life. I mean, is that a regular kitty cat he's holding? No, that is uh that that's a lion. I can, lion, how yeah. So how big would you have to be to I, I mean I've got a 20 pound cat. If I tried to hold him that way, I would be in shreds. Um <laughs> that is not a happy lion. Uh so yeah, he's super sized. Nice kitty. All right. So um, let's talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, this is the tragic plot structure. It shows the rise and fall of a human being often accompanied by death. Um, and the comic plot structure shows you getting into more and more trouble and then getting out of it. I'm sure you have seen the tragedy and comedy masks. Uh, but the curve is right there. If you see the up and down curve in tragedy, it comes out as a frown. Uh, the down and up curve of comedy is a smile. So it's to remind us uh, which is which. Now, how do I get back? Does that come from here? Okay, here we go. Um, so, with Gilgamesh, we find uh, that he goes through kind of a rise and fall over the course of his uh, life. This is a um, this is a tragedy which ends in his death. Um, it's not as long as the other as Greek um, tragedies, uh, possibly because it's written on clay. I mean, the Greek tragedies are on paper and they take forever um, to produce. The, uh, the story of Gilgamesh is much shorter. 
Uh, there's a remarkable amount of repetition in it, given the difficulty of, um, you know, etching in clay and then baking it. Uh, why do you say the same stuff over and over? And there must have been come some kind of important role. Maybe it just helps people remember. All right, so at the beginning, we see uh, Gilgamesh. He's two-thirds God, one-third man. Um, if you're a geneticist, that's rather hard to get to. Um, you know, half and half is easy. One quarter is easy. Uh, if we mixed a quarter with, an, uh, with a half, would that be a third? I'm trying to figure out how do we get to one third God. Um, so one fourth times one third is one twelfth. Dang, I can't remember that stuff. Uh, okay, so mystic math. This is mystic math. Two thirds God, one third man. Uh, bigger than life. Um, and what does he do with his incredible power? Uh, he has his way with the women and beats up the men. So it's all about him um, kind of pursuing his own uh, impulses. Whatever impulse I have, that's what I'm going to be able to do. Now, is this a proper king? Uh, the... he Go ahead. He's more of a tyrant. Yeah, he's more of a tyrant or despot or uh, dictator or, you know, whatever bad wor word for bad ruler, bad absolute ruler uh, you want to come up with. Uh, it's all about him. Um, he's not ruling in, when we get to Aristotle, he will argue that the good version of a state or a government devolves into the bad version when the governing forces, whatever they may be, stop ruling for themselves or stop ruling for the common good and start ruling for their own short-term interests. Uh, let's say that there's a plague stalking the land, uh, but you're worried more about getting reelected than you are stopping the plague. Something like that, as hard as it is to imagine. Um, so, Despot, um, tyrant, um, Gilgamesh is just following whatever feeling he has that particular time. That's what he does. He's a spoiled rich kid. He's no uh, ruler. Oh, um, Lion King. Do you remember that song, I Can't Wait to Be King? And why did Simba want to be king? He thought it was going to be fun. Yeah, because there'll be nobody to tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want to. I'm the decider. You know, so uh, everybody will have to follow what I say. And that's what's great about being king. Well, what would have been in it for the pride if Simba had grown up to be that kind of king? I mean, he would just... go ahead. Anarchy. Yeah, yeah. it's fallen to ruin. Right. He was immature and not ready to take the reins yet. Um, so he had to learn from his father. Okay, I'm going to move my uh, computer. Hold on. Uh. I need to go get the plug. I'll be right back. That's a lot of fives. <laughs> I'd say more than one. It's basically okay. just five with a dash above it. If you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah, it, it, at least three. Dare I say four? Possibly five. So many no, no, lines. too far. Yeah. Probably going to be like a million ditches or something. I don't know. I mean, it, yeah, it's still going. I can tell from the, at the very uh, left of it that it's slightly it's, moving. It's jiggling. Yeah. OK. 
Okay, and also I'm going to plug in my computer so it does not die. All right, can y'all hear me? Oops. Yes. I can hear you. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Turns out I'm really loud and uh, my lectures disturb the family who do not seem to enjoy <laughs> hearing about Gilgamesh uh, as much as you guys who could imagine. Uh, maybe they've heard it too much. Okay, so where were we? He's a despot. Can you hear me all right? That's loud mm -hmm. enough? All right. Mm -hmm. Making sure my mic is close enough. Um, so what do the people do? They, they, um, they throw a tea party and uh, declare it to be a republic. Oh no, that's another uh, story. Uh, no, they pray to the gods that they will send him a companion who will be suitable to restrain his worst impulses and uh, guide him to be uh, a better person. And so they create Enkidu. Uh, this is a very hairy Enkidu uh, living by a pond. <coughs> Um, think Sasquatch or Bigfoot, but if, oh crap, if Gilgamesh is a man of civilization, how did he look? Um, I mean, obviously he spends a lot of time getting his hair done, right? Uh, He's town, he's got nice clothes. That's probably some kind of whip he can whip people with. Uh, so all, you know, very civilized, um, but not a nice person. And Kidu, on the other hand, is the wild man who is a natural gentleman. And this kind of pairing is not that uncommon. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to watch this show, The Lone Ranger, who was, uh, American, and then he had his sidekick, uh, the uh, man of nature, Tonto, who was Native American. Uh, anyway, a trapper comes across him. And if you look at this, uh, it can almost be an allegory for the development of civilization, the evolution of civilization. Uh, humans are 300,000 years old. For about 290,000 of those years, how did we survive? Just some hunters and gatherers. Right. And so a trapper is a hunter, right? Um, you can either run them down or you can trap them, but he's living at that level. Um, I was reading a story about early Louisiana where this guy would find a beehive and in a tree and he would chop down the tree and eat the honey. Well, oh my God. <laughs> How long could that go on once you get a lot of people? You need beekeepers, right? Who will not destroy the hive, they will keep the hive. Uh, so he's a trapper. This is the first level of human survival. He comes out there trapping and he sees in Kido and says, ah, Sasquatch. That's what we've been waiting for. Uh, but we've got to trap him. And how does he trap in Kido? I'm guessing it has something to do with the uh, sacred prostitute there. Right. You send a woman to trap the wild man and tame him. Um, now, sacred prostitutes, um, imagine, if you will, going to church to have a, a date with a prostitute. Uh, it's not too smiled upon in Baptist circles I grew up in. But if you go back, most... Um, religions, especially early on, have some component of um, fertility ritual. I mean, it's there in Christianity, right? What's with the bunnies and the Easter eggs at Easter? What are those about? It's about new life. It new life? Sense. Well, they're about sex. <laughs> um, because that's how you get the bunnies and the new life. They, you know, they're innocent, but the 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 mama bunny and the daddy bunny and the, the daddy rooster and the mama hen, uh, they've been up to something. Uh, and fertility religions were really upfront about that. How am I going as a man 
uh, I'm going, going to be sure that I have lots of children. Uh, I go to the temple, I pray, I give them my money, and uh, they assign me a sacred prostitute. And uh, the sacred prostitute gets me energized so that I can then go have kids. And a female version of this uh, could be, um, the opposite version of this could be what they're thinking about with the legend of Gilgamesh. Uh, Prima Noctis, oh my, I need a, oh, here's. Prima Nox. Does anybody know what that is? First night in Latin. Uh, it was the idea that the local power that was, um, you know, whoever was the top chief person would have sex with the bride before she had sex with her husband, which could be that he's right two thirds God. And so uh, you want to be touched by divinity so that he could uh, uh, help you transition from being uh, not having kids to having kids. Um, so yeah. Uh, a sacred prostitute goes out there. How long are they together? It was like, it was like a, a week. It, it was a week, so I'm pretty sure. Yes. Or no. Oh, okay. It was a week. Now, what are the natural periods of time? Um, by natural, I mean that we derive from nature. Natural period of times would be seasons. Okay, seasons, that's good. In, uh, depending on where you live in the world, what else? Something everybody everywhere in the world has. Days and nights. Days and nights, very good. What else? Now, day and night, that's based on what? Hours? Uh, we don't have hours. That we will have to invent. Uh, seasons are based on the um, tilt of the earth. What are days and nights built on? The rotation. Rotation, oh. very good. Okay, what other natural period of time is there? The solstice? Uh, well, that's part of season. That's how we measure our season, solstice and equinox. What does the dirt earth do in addition to rotating? It orbits around the sun. Right, and what period of time does that give us? It gives us years. Yeah. Revolution as opposed to rotation. Seasons, tilt of the earth. And one more has to do with what we see when we look up into the night sky. It's the, um, the phases of the moon. Right. And what do the phases of the moon give us? What period of time? A month. A month. All right. Okay, so uh, we've got days and nights. And this is something everybody everywhere always has. We've got years and we've got months. I guess, uh, let's, okay, a little OCD coming up here. Okay, is that from shorter to longer? <laughs> <laughs> what do we not have? We already said hours. What else? Minutes. Um... We have minutes, seconds, all that stuff. Also, uh, oh, yes. Is the week a natural period of time? No, not really. Not exactly. I mean, to some extent, it's, it's based... It can be if you do 
new moon, half moon, full moon, half moon, you come up with four weeks in a month, but it's by no means universal. The Romans had the calends on the first day of the month. They had the nones on the ninth day. And then what did they have on the 15th? Remember your Julius I Caesar? The Ides, that's right. So first night, 15th, those are division periods. So it was more like a fortnight. Um, no moon, full moon, no moon, full moon. Uh, they didn't mess with the half moons. And when uh, Jewish folks started showing up in Rome with weeks, they didn't quite know what to think about this. Uh, what are these people doing uh, every seven days? That's weird. I'm a prosecutor. Um, but what you notice is that here we are in Sumer and they have weeks. So it may well be that when the Bible says Abram was from Ur, that there's actually a lot of uh, Mesopotamia. There's a lot more overlap between this mythology and what you find in the Old Testament uh, than between the Old Testament and the Greeks or the Old Testament and the Egyptians. All right, so we're going to tame Enkidu with a sacred prostitute. Uh, they have sex. After the end of that, um, the animals are scared of him. He smells like humans and also... Um, he's not as fast as he was. He's been sitting around. Uh, next, we start taking him back to town. Uh, we're going to go to Shepherds. What is the second level of um, society after we get through trapping and hunting and uh, gathering? Yeah, herding farming. and farming. Farming. Uh, or before farming, often shepherding. Uh, the this is a higher level of civilization usually. Shepherding, they're still kind of nomadic. They have to follow the grass. Um, and what do the shepherds give him that help him with the transition from um, a Sasquatch to a civilized Sasquatch? Uh, they give him things like bath, clothes, haircut, but also uh, bread and beer. And where do these things come from? This come from shepherding? Farming. No. It comes Fermenting. from farming. That's right. So the shepherds and the farmers have been trading. And so the trip from wilderness to uh, Ur, Uruk is like a trip from uh, past to present. The city is kind of, um, you know, this is the crown jewel of civilization. But as you go out, you go back in time. And the further out you get, uh, the more primitive they are. I mean, have you ever taken a drive from Ruston out into the country? You still get that feeling, right? Uh, Ruston, uh, we've got places to eat. We've got, you know, bars. We've got, uh, um, you can get a gyro sandwich, for goodness sake. Uh, I remember the first uh, the foreign exotic food that came to Ruston back in the 60s, they called it pizza. We didn't know what to do with that. Uh, what is this pizza thing you're talking about? Uh, it took me a while to adjust and find a flavor I like. But as you go out, you find um, not, you know, the people are different, the way things they do are different. Uh, finally, he comes to town. This is a long, like, arrow. And what happens when he and Gilgamesh meet? They fight, fight initially. Fight, they fight. fight. Yeah, that's right. But it's a friendship fight, like at the beginning of every John Wayne movie. You know, you go in, you walk into the saloon, you throw your coin down and say, whiskey. And um, after you say whiskey, uh, you get a little drink in you, and then you have a fight with the other people that have been getting some drinks. And at the end of it, they're sitting there, they've lost a tooth or two, black eye, but they're all laughing, and they're buddies, and they're going to spend the rest of the movie finding the gold or, uh, you know, whatever it is you do in Westerns. Mm. Let's go back up. So, um, now, they fight because um, Enkidu has a 
core sense of decency, which this highly evolved, highly civilized, but horribly spoiled brat of a king, uh, he does not have that uh, civility. So uh, he starts to learn it from Enkidu. And the next phase is, um, it's not enough just not to be a villain. Right. If you want to be a hero, you've got to do something heroic. And what would be heroic? I know. Let's go kill Humbaba, guardian of the cedar forest. Were these in Lebanon? Yeah, that looks more like it. So uh, forests have some great stuff in them. Uh, uh, we call it wood. <laughs> also, they're animals. Uh, and these would make great supplies for, um, you know, us living here in uh, Uruk. But we can't get that great stuff because Humbaba. Now, is Humbaba a villain in this? He's just a guardian. Yeah, he's doing his job. Do we have any Humbaba here? No, I got off into allegory, sorry. Um, maybe somebody drew Humbaba. Mm, maybe this is... Him as a lion, some depict him as scaly. Oh, or cool. Things. Ugh. Getting the images. There we go. So it does kind of lionish, don't you think? Maybe. Um, yeah, maybe on the outside. Well, maybe the hair, but grimacing, not very friendly looking. Oh, here we go. He looks like a leprechaun. Uh, <laughs> he must have been much, much bigger. Okay, so uh, we get into the allegorical interpretation of dreams. How do you interpret dreams? And he always has these horrible nightmares before battle, and then somebody has to sp explain it in a way that uh, it sounds not so bad. Oh, well, this is what it really means. Anyway, um, he can't admit to himself that he's afraid, right? So. Uh, they do the they kill Humbaba, and I think I think it's isn't it in Kido that says no, we've got to kill him. We can't just let him go. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, because Humbaba was begging to be um, to be spared, and then Kido right. was the one that kept telling them to kill him. Yeah, and you know you got to wonder about old in Kido, um, and you wonder about this as a heroic act. I mean, we're on the other side of it, but even at the time, okay. What are we looking at? We're looking at what was once upon a time called the Fertile Crescent. <laughs> now, why did they call this the Fertile Crescent? They were able to grow I, stuff there. You could grow stuff there. What happened? You know what happened? We happened. Sounds we, about right. We destroyed it. Uh, they kept irrigating it, and they didn't realize they were putting more and more salt on there. And so over time, the salt poisoned the land, and you could no longer farm it. Sounds about right. Yeah. And of course, right now we are busy doing that to the whole planet. And I just had somebody on Facebook tell me, Brucey, man can't change climate. I was like, wake up, you know. Uh, <laughs> what is wrong with people? Um, why don't we seem to have the ability to stop from killing the planet that we're living on? And yet we do. Um, my best friend told me, you know, the problem with the country is uh, too many regulations. What's the most polluted state in the country? 
I don't know. There may be a competition, but I bet that we win, right? Uh, Louisiana is pretty far up there. Are we the richest state in the country? No, it's just because of all the chemicals here. Right. We've let them mess up our state, but we haven't, it, it hasn't led to super prosperity like my best friend who lives right down the road thinks. Oh, if we just had fewer regulations, uh, somehow money would start flowing in. No, it's just pollution. It's destroying the planet. And we are a few years away from making it too hot to live in. Um, climate change. <clears throat> But if you go back home trying to talk about that crazy Uncle Liberty as he's barbecuing hamburgers, what's he going to think about all that climate change? That's a whole lot of bowl hunting. <laughs> That's right. It's a plot by the Chinese to get us to be poor. Um, so Humbaba, you know, in 2020, uh, this part of the story opens up a whole you know, world of um, really modern issues uh, like, uh, you know, any kind of environmental issue you have, uh, you can see it kind of starting there. All right, so the third um, uh, part of this story, uh, this is a story kind of in five acts. Uh, third part, uh, Gilgamesh is acting like a hero now. He's killed Humbaba. Um, and so a goddess looks down from heaven and says, ooh, what a hunk of hunk of man. We can have babies that are thirds. So two thirds times three thirds. What is that? Five six. What is it? Five six, five, six. We can have babies that are five, six uh, uh, God. Uh, that would be awesome. Now, Ishtar serves double duty. Um, she's the goddess of love, hence, you know, her lust. But she's also the goddess of war. Uh, now, somewhere along the way, uh, in our tradition, we picked up the weird notion that love and war are two different and conflicting things. Make love, not war. Uh, no ancient would make that mistake. Uh, what are we usually fighting about? Love. Love, right? Some version of love. You drive by any honky-tonk in Louisiana on any Saturday night, a couple of guys out or a couple of women out, and what are they fighting over? They're just punching away at each other. If I'm because someone took the girl. That's right. You took my woman, you took my man, something like that. And um, they're fighting over it. My love leads to war. Uh, so Ishtar has both of them together. Um, and how does Gilgamesh react? Dude, Tells I don't want to be your wife. It's like he's he's not just politely turning her down, right? It's a thorough yeah, no, going. It brutal. Yeah, it's a brutal put down. Um, it's this idea that... Um, pretty, but I don't want to be your, your husband. Right, because all the guys you have sex with uh, die. Um, <laughs> so there's a way in which our gods and goddesses kind of represent the aristocracy of our own society. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and so when it comes to male gods getting together with female humans, uh, do the stories encourage that? Typically, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. It's always a god going after a woman, and they have a great hero for a child and sets up a line, and it's all great. That's pretty much um, all Greek mythology. Yeah, it's pretty much all the Greek stories. What about, and we find this same thing in the um, Homeric hymn to Aphrodite, because a lot of gods, uh, goddesses getting together with people, they list all the bad outcomes. So goddess gets together with a mortal human man. Uh, do we want to encourage that? No. No, because we don't want our aristocratic women having affairs with uh, John the pool boy, right? Um, 
We want them staying as far away from that as possible. And so in our mythology, uh, we're going to downplay it. Now, he totally disses Ishtar. What's her response? Uh, kill him, get the bull. Just get, get the, the bull. Get the bull of heaven. Now there's another, um, well, we'll get to that. Um, she goes to daddy, says, um, oh my goodness, uh, he's been so mean to me. Can I kill him with the bull of heaven? He says, sure, honey, whatever you want. What happens when Humbaba and Gilgamesh face the bull of heaven? Dead. They just slaughter that poor thing. Dead. Right, yes, it's barbecue time. So the bull is the guardian of the heavens, which means the heavens are now essentially undefended against Gilgamesh and Humbaba. The, all the gods get nervous because, oh my gods, these two guys, uh, it looks like they're tougher than us. But what is the difference between a god and a human, the basic fundamental difference? Gods are immortal. Gods are immortal, immortales. Humans are mortales. Uh, what does mors mean in Latin? Mortis. Death. Death, right? So uh, humans are susceptible to death. Gods are not susceptible to death. So if we want to show these men, these mortal men, who's who, how do we do that? You send, uh, you send something immortal to, you to send kill them. coronavirus. Uh, um, and it's going to bring down their pride, right? Uh, you think you're so big. You think you're so bad. You've beaten everything uh, bigger than you. What about something much, much smaller, something you don't even know what it is. I mean, they don't have a, a theory of disease yet. Um, at least we've got a theory, even if we're not like particularly well responding to it. Uh, they did not. And it could take a strong person and lay them low. So which one of them gets sick? Indiku. Indiku gets sick. Um, how long does he last? Oh, God, it was... It, I don't even remember. I just remember that they specifically made it as painful and drawn out as possible. Right. I think, was that a week as well? Am I, I right think it was three that? weeks. Oh, three weeks. Okay. I thought it was like 12 days or something like that. Okay. Um, I don't remember though. So uh, somewhere, it's a while because he's a strong man. Uh, and the disease wastes him away. Uh, how does Gilgamesh react to his death? He's upset. Right. He lost it. Super upset. And what's he upset about, uh, Riley? He's upset that, that the fact that his brother, aka Enkidu, is dead. Right. And what does that mean for him? Gilgamesh had grew, grown as a person. He's yeah. no longer, give me this, give me that. Oh, heck, heck to well, you. And now he's more compassionate, more understanding, less self -defense. Let's hope so and hold on to that because that's a core debate over the uh, ultimate meaning of Gilgamesh. So we'll get back to that. Uh, but what's he keep saying over and over while he's mourning the death of his friend? Who else is going to die someday? He is. He is. Oh my God, I'm going to die. And so I, you know, I, I didn't count the lines, but the lines where he said, oh, I'm so sorry, my friend is dead. This is terrible. Very few, lots and lots of lines to devoted to, oh my God, I'm going to die. Uh, there's also this thing about the limits of your power. Um, give me something to hit and I'll hit it. Um, did any of you, any Buffy fans in this class? Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So for five seasons, she just hits stuff, right? Kicks it, uh, stabs it, chops heads off, and nothing's too big of a um, force for her to face. But then in the fifth season, her mom gets sick, 
and she gets, um, what is it, brain cancer? Uh, what can you do if you're a vampire slayer and you're faced with brain cancer? Not a whole lot, right? And at the end of this cycle, she comes home one night, spoilers, <laughs> um, or one morning, and finds her mom dead on the couch. And she tries to give her CPR. And what's all your super strength combined with all that adrenaline do when you're giving somebody CPR? Uh, she just, instead of bringing her mom back to life, she just cracks her ribs uh, because all of her superpowers are no good here. And that's the same thing with Gilgamesh, right? All of the powers that he has to face Humbaba, to face uh, all the people of his uh, town, uh, to face uh, Enkidu, to face the bull of heaven, they're no good. Disease is something you can't fight uh, with uh, just hitting it. It has to be something else. Um, so worried about his mortality. Well, f how long does he keep the body of Humbaba uh, and refuse to let them uh, bury him? I mean, not Humbaba, um, Enkidu. I think it may be a week. You've got me doubting myself. Uh, does he keep the body a week? I, I don't remember that exact detail. I don't I remember the, the body. He, he keeps the body several days um, until a worm falls out of his nose. So um, he's starting the decomposition process, right? Um, stuff having to do with death, you know, it, it, when we die somehow, that'll be my body lying there, but in some way it's not me anymore. Whatever was animating me, whatever was making me alive is gone. And so what do we do with the person after they've died? How do we make that transition from uh, me to not me? Sometimes it's burning and it's pretty clear. Uh, sometimes it's burial. There are other, uh, lots of other uh, funeral approaches, but they all have to deal with this movement um, you know, in a way, somebody is no longer the person that they were. And that decomposition process is represented by the worm falling out of his nose. Kind of gross to think about. But it's then that he says, oh, he's really dead. He's not coming back. Uh, and then he finally has kind of a quest worthy of a great two-thirds god, one-third man hero. And what is that? He seeks. He yeah, seeks world for world himself. I'm seeking eternal life, and the best explanation I've heard of it, uh, what he does, uh, is the idea that they live on the flat plane of the earth, covered by a dome. The sun goes over the earth on a track and then goes under it at night through a tunnel and around again. So Gilgamesh, being the great hero he is. He's able to go through the tunnel quickly the other way while the sun is out uh, and make it to the other side, uh, which is where he finds sort of a, you know, afterworld or uh, a paradise of, ki of a kind. Uh, so who does he see when he gets to the other side of the tunnel? Wasn't it another goddess that he saw, uh, a goddess of wisdom and she also gives him beer. Yes, uh, she's uh, like the tavern at the end of the world, right? Um, that's something like from Token, isn't it? Um, and what does she say to him when he sees, when she sees him? You she's, good, dude? You look scary. You look like a murderer. And of course he is, right? Um, you don't look right. <laughs> well, and... Does he look like that same young guy who had the fastest chariot in town and the most expensive clothes in town and the super duper hairdo that we met at the beginning of the story? No. No, he's he beginning. So good. Right. So while they seem to follow quickly after each other, this is a story of a young man, the despot. Uh, this, these are a man in his prime. Here you're starting to get older. 
and uh, here you're feeling the hoof beats of death getting uh, coming toward you uh, as he seeks eternal life. Um, when would you do that? You don't do it at 20 because you guys already have eternal life. You're never going to die, right? That's why you're going to all those COVID parties. You're licking doorknobs and putting it on Instagram because um, nothing can touch you. You're bulletproof. You're speeding down the road, uh, riding on the hood of the car uh, while your friend goes around curves. It's just all kinds of uh, antics we get up to when we're young because we have no con But me? I feel like you've seen yeah. this. Yeah, what, what do I see when I look in the mirror at night? This old bald guy. I mean, I've, I don't wear a suit all that much. And I had a suit on for a wedding. And I was looking at the wedding pictures later. I was like, wait, was dad still alive when we had that wedding? I looked real close. Oh, that old fart's me. <laughs> I turned <laughs> into my dad. Oh, my God. Um, <clears throat> so... Yeah, now I would maybe go on a trip hunting eternal life. It's time for me to go down to Mexico and find some illegal drug that they sell down there, right? Um, and so after he gets the beer, uh, who's he meet up with? A river guardian. Yeah, right. And uh, who's the dude he meets? A, a man and his wife. Let's get to them. What's Upna Pishtim's claim to fame? Why did the gods reward him with this eternal life in this paradise? They flooded the earth and he survived on a ship. Right. So what biblical character is he like? Noah. Noah. He's like Noah. Old man Noah. He's their version of Noah. Again, I mean, the Greeks had Deucalion. But um, uh, but there are a lot of overlaps here with this story and the story of Noah later. Uh, except, don't they throw rocks to reproduce after they? Or was that Deucalion? I can't remember which one. Um, and so he wants eternal life. How do I get eternal life? Upna Pishtim. He says, uh, "You want to conquer death." First, you must conquer sleep. Sleep and death are almost always related in literature, in mythology. Um, death is the iron sleep, the eternal sleep. Um, sleep is the little death. You know, the, we die a little bit every night. We stop moving around. Uh, we seem, you know, and it can be hard. If you've known somebody really sick at the end of life, uh, it can be really hard to tell if they're sleeping or if they're dead. Uh, it, it's really unnerving to be in one of those situations. You can't wake somebody up and you're not sure which is which. Um, so is Gilgamesh, by the power of his heroism and his huge muscles, able to overcome sleep? He fell asleep the first time. He's yeah. like, 15 minutes later, he's like... <laughs> Right? And how long does he sleep? Shoot, I forgot. A week, this one, I think. Yes, definitely. Because when he wakes up, there are seven loaves of bread. And the bread from today is fresh, it's hot, uh, it's, you know, tastes good. What about the bread from yesterday? Not oh. quite as fresh. You know, they, in the ancient world, did not have preservatives that they, uh, you know, like a Twinkie. There's a webcam somewhere taking a picture of a Twinkie every day for years, sitting out on a shelf, and it looks exactly the same, right? Uh, there's one for a, a Burger King burger, and it kind of shrinks at first, and then just sits there for, you know, uh, months and then years. Uh, but bread in the ancient world had a limited shelf life because uh, the second day it's stale. What about the three day old bread? It's going to start getting a little moldy. It's going to get moldy. And by the seventh day, it's thoroughly uh, molded and no good anymore. And that way, uh, because Upna Pishtim knows his uh, tyrants when he sees them, 
uh, he knows that Gilgamesh won't believe him unless he brings out the bread. How else am I going to have all this stale bread here if it didn't set it out for you every day? But there's one out, even for that. You can't overcome it on your own. Is there some external thing that can give him eternal life? Yeah, there's a flower that he could find. Yes, tree of life, right? Uh, this is yet another overlap between uh, Genesis and Gilgamesh, the tree of life. Um, I mean, I've studied a lot of Greek mythology. I don't remember this being in Greek mythology. I could be wrong. I, it's probably in the underworld, I think. Maybe, right? If you could get to the underworld and get the right plant. Um, I, I, I think that actually sounds pretty familiar to me, uh, honestly. So, well, there's a lot of Greek mythology. I know a lot of Greek mythology, but nobody, know, you know, can't keep up with all of it. What is Yggdrasil in? What's that? Yggdrasil. That's the Nordic. Tree. Ah, and what does that do? Tell me about that. I just heard, I just heard about Yggdrasil. I think it, it's probably just a tree. A tree it connects, that it connects the, uh, the heavens to the earth, I'm pretty sure. Uh, or it's something. It's it's a it's a very important tree. I do I do remember that. But I'm pretty sure just in Norse mythology, it's the thing that sort of keeps the world uh, connected. Is that the place where Idris Alba is standing up there? I'm guarding this thing, and it's kind of a mystic yes. guarding guarding it from. I forget the name. A big serpent that eats at the roots. Ah, right. Okay, I have heard of that, uh, but the very debased form I saw in all those movies. Uh, okay, where are we going? All right, so Tree of Life. Uh, cool. Uh, and he eats it right away and lives forever, right? No. What happens? He it under his nose. He's, he's, what's he doing with the Tree of Life? He was trying to bring it back to his town and give it to like all the old people. Right. Now, if Riley Runkle is correct in her thesis, what is his motivation in taking this plant back and giving it to old people first? He's trying to grant everyone eternal life. Which right. Is I want this gift. Good. I want this gift for my people first. And the professor who taught me, uh, Gilgamesh, that's his theory that he has learned, right? Uh, repeat what you said a little while ago about him learning along the way, Riley. You know, the part well, I said, hold on to. He's, I think he's grown as a person. He's a lot less selfish. He's a lot less self-thinking and starts to think more about others. So uh, that is a possibility, right? Oh, mm -hmm. crud. I was trying to make it so people could see you talking, and now I've messed up my... Maybe I need to click that. There we go. There y'all come. All right. Um, is there another possibility here? He doesn't want anybody else to have it. But he does. He wants the old men to have it first. But why would he want that? Of his I, I he is a... see it. He is a king in the ancient world. Has he ever had a hot meal? Of course he has. Uh, what slows him down from eating this nice hot food? Oh, oh, it might be poisoned. <gasps> it might be poisoned. And yeah, so, I just remember. It might be a trick from the gods. Right, before you eat it, what you need to do as a uh, wise king you give it to someone else. Feed it to the servant, right? Uh, we see this next period when we get to the story of Joseph and the cupbearer of uh, uh, Pharaoh. And what's the what's the job of the cupbearer? The cupbearer is one. They, they bring you your drink, but what do you do before the Pharaoh drinks it? You drink it first. Right, got to get your, and make sure it's good. And did y'all watch, uh, it wasn't the Red Wedding, it was the other one where the asshole king dies after his wedding uh, in uh, Game of Thrones. 
uh, you know, he didn't have his cupbearer drink first, a very stupid oversight. And what about your food? What do you do before you eat it? You give someone it a taste test. You have a taste tester, right? And so something important that's claiming to be a, like me, with the super duper vaccine that's right around the corner, what did I say it would need to happen before I take it? How many people are going to die of it first? Right. We let some students try it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think in China they're giving it to their soldiers or something like that and see what happens. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, in which case, has he necessarily learned that much? Yeah, he hasn't learned that. He hasn't learned to be a better person, but he's learned how to be to be a good king. He's a better king, but it's possible that he's still as selfish as he's ever been. Now, both of these are very real possibilities based on the text. What's going to make us decide uh, for one of these or the other? I guess it's what he's tell or what uh, Gilgamesh says. Well, and also what I hear, right? Um, I had a guy tell me one time, my problem is that I'm a selfish, self-centered son of a bitch. Uh, and he's not the only one. Um, and so uh, when I read this story, what do I see? I see a selfish, self-centered son of a bitch. Um, I see another selfish guy, and I think, oh, yeah, if I were doing that, why would I be doing that? Uh, because if I really thought for sure, for sure, for sure, this was the tree of life and they weren't trying to trick me, what would I do with this plant? I would, it I would eat it immediately, right? Yeah. Because that's the way I am. Uh, me first and then everybody else. Uh, so that's what I think about Gilgamesh, but that says more about me than it does about Gilgamesh, just as uh, Riley seeing uh, Gilgamesh is finally becoming a decent human being uh, says a lot of good stuff about her. <laughs> you're probably- I'm of the per <laughs> You're probably- I'm of the per Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. Uh, I'm of the personal uh, belief that uh, the, one of my favorite phrases is that uh, just if you give human beings the benefit of the doubt, they will prove you wrong every single time. Right. And that's, and that's the philosophy that I have. Very skeptical, very cynical, of a, very much a man like myself. Uh, and uh, somebody who sees good in people sees good in Gilgamesh. Um, so uh, this isn't a question with a right answer. It's a reader response. How do we respond to Gilgamesh? Um, and so if you are kind of generous uh, giving person, then you see that. If you're not, then you don't. Um, all right, so what happens to the magical plant? It's gone. Who takes it? I forgot who took it. Does anybody um, yes, snake. say say it again, Abigail. Um, I think a snake came and it wrapped around it and took it away while he was bathing. Right. Where have we seen this snake before? Adam and Eve. Adam and snake. Eve, right? So once he was, again, he was the one that convinced Adam and Eve to eat the fruits. He's like, yes. Hey, Eve, take this. You'll you'll be very powerful. You'll be very knowledgeable. And Eve's like, Are you sure about that? And he's like, Trust me. Trust me, would I lie to you? Um, and so we find uh, the serpent playing a very similar role in uh, Hebrew stories as well as Mesopotamian stories. Another overlap um, with the snake uh, not being kind of dragony and blowing out flame, but being a liar who's able to deceive you. He's more subtle than the other animals. Um, and also sh snakes shed their skin, which was seen as a uh, indication of renewal, that 
a new young snake comes out where the old snake was, although we know that's not true. Some people uh, tended to think that. And at the very end, we get a list of actual accomplishments, things that he did uh, when he wasn't conquering. Uh, when he wasn't involved in these adventures. Yeah, let's see. We need to find that. Ah, here we go. Ah. Hmm. Here we go. Can I blow that up? Okay, they've got offerings. Oh, where's the list of his, he made doors and things. an exciting life outside of being a king then. Right. He had these adventures, but then he did other stuff. Uh, okay. This may not be in our version. Uh, the story of Gilgamesh was rather widespread and it doesn't look like they have it. Um, but in some versions of the story, they have like... Um, the temple doors he built, uh, the other stuff. And, you know, he built this, he built that kind of public works kind of stuff that great kings do and left behind that when he uh, died. So that was his legacy rather than eternal life. Uh, but it was uh, the idea that in between these adventures, he was home ruling and actually doing stuff for the kingdom rather than um, just for himself. Okay. Any questions about Gilgamesh? Oh, this looks, uh, I'm in the wrong class. Hold on. I just taught that in the summer. We're in 103. There we go. Okay, good. Let's see what we're doing next time. Okay, so Wednesday, we'll do parts of Wednesday. Genesis. What's today? Tuesday? Yeah, Thursday. Tuesday. Right, sorry. A lot of times I teach this as a Monday, Wednesday class. So, um, uh, yeah, Thursday, we will uh, read parts of Genesis, talk about that. Then uh, at the end of the week, there will be a quiz. Uh, you can have all weekend to take it. It's like 10 questions over. Uh, basically, Gilgamesh and Genesis. Um, and uh, then next week, we'll have one over Exodus and Psalms. If we have one next week, we may at times have one every couple of weeks because these quizzes are a pain to get together. Um, but it'll be at least every two weeks. Uh, and I'll try for every week, but I can't promise it. All right, any questions before we dismiss? All right. Well, I enjoyed the class. Good discussion. And now you think I'm a terrible person. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'm going to log off. See you guys next time. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.